I also have to say, this is one of the neatest books I've run across in all of my inquiry. I really like how you write as well as what you're writing. And so I'm looking forward to completing it. Wish I had a chance to do it before we met. <laughs> Having said that, I think we still have enough, even in my limited knowledge of your particular work, to have a pretty good conversation. I suspect so from our, our beginnings thus far. Good. So um, in group one, let's start with the, uh, well, actually, give us a little bio sketch on yourself, if that's okay. Kind of like how you got to be in linguistics and what your passion is about that. Sure. I started out as an undergraduate at Brandeis University, where I had the honor of being thrown into what was then the new way of doing linguistics, namely Chomsky's, at that point, Transformational Generative Grammar. And I say the honor because I had the opportunity not just to study with some of his students who were my teachers, but also to go and sit in on some of his classes at MIT and to see his mind at work. And I learned an awful lot about how you present a position, an unpopular position, how you defend it, uh, and then uh, went on from there to decide whether I agreed or not with that particular approach to language. I then uh, went to a summer institute of linguistics in the University of Michigan and met a number of people from Stanford University who had a very different approach to what's interesting about language. I ended up going to graduate school at Stanford, getting interested in child language acquisition and historical linguistics. In particular, I was interested in how we can learn from watching children today learning to speak about what sorts of processes they may be, or their ancestors may have been responsible for in helping shape the course of language change many centuries ago. I got interested in written language from looking at a book on Maya hieroglyphs. And I said, is this language? And if so, what kind of language? Is this really writing? How does it differ from alphabets and so forth? At the same time, I was teaching at Brown University at the time, I became involved with one of the then graduate students who was principal of the Rhode Island School for the Deaf and became fascinated with questions of signing systems, how they differed from spoken language, how they differed from written language, what kinds of problems deaf kids seem to be having in learning to read, much less learning to speak. And from there, I did a book called Speech Writing and Sign, trying to look at how these different forms of language encapsulated to some extent the same sorts of issues, how they were structurally similar or different, how they were functionally similar or different. And from there, I became interested in the influence of technology on spoken and written language. So I began looking historically at what effects the printing press did or did not have on written language. We tend to think the printing press suddenly made us all great spellers. Uh, not true. We tend to think the printing press suddenly made for widespread literacy. Not true. We tend to think the printing press largely eliminated a lot of manuscript writing. Not true. Uh, more recently, I've gotten interested in contemporary technologies for the last century or so, starting with the telegraph, then looking at the telephone, now absolutely looking at the effects of computer-based language email, instant messaging, short text messaging on cell phones, and what that's doing to us as speakers and as writers of language. So while you take it, um, some difference with McLuhan, the, the, you're very concerned with the medium. Always I'm very concerned with the medium. I look upon McLuhan in some ways the same way I look upon Giambattista Vico, who had some fascinating notions about how language evolved and how writing evolved, uh, some of which must be wrong, <laughs> none of which were backed up by any evidence. But reading Vico and reading McLuhan, you stop and think. You ask, is it the case that when suddenly we became a nation of typists, we changed the way we thought about writing? We changed the way we thought about how we present ourselves. So, for example, Mokulin has actually written on the typewriter and what it did. Uh, one of the things we know is as typing became a new way in businesses, or small businesses largely at the time, of, express, uh, of encoding the manuscript, the, the records and so forth that you had to have, people started caring significantly about spelling. Dictionaries began to sell in large numbers, uh, just as they had in the early days of the Republic when people, thanks to... Uh, Noah Webster's blueback speller, they said, we have to learn how to be literate. Now we have to learn how to spell correctly because 
This typewriter is unforgiving. You can fudge when you write by hand. Uh, and as I later learned, you can fudge with the typewriter too. You can backspace and strike over if you don't know if it's an E or an I you're supposed to be using. But we changed our sensitivities and sensibilities about what spelling is about when the technology made us do so. Similarly, we changed our styles of speaking when technology made us do so. The telephone is an excellent example. So when the telephone was first invented by Alexander Graham Bell, there was no bell at the end to ring that conversation was wanted. Instead, you had to hail the person at the other end of the line. What Alexander Graham Bell had us do was shout, Ahoy! Well, his arch rival, Thomas Alva Edison, who didn't get the patent in on time for the telephone, but ended up manufacturing some of the telephone machinery, he decided he was going to do it differently. And he took a word that was absolutely not used in polite society, namely, hello, which used to be a call not used by women and not used in front of women for calling hounds to the hunt. And he said, that's the way we're going to page people <laughs> on their phones at the other end of the line. So suddenly, hello, entered the language today. It's a very polite way to say greetings, thanks to the technology that required us to have some way of getting people's attention. A convention that got it fixed to the rise of the technology. Absolutely. It's very interesting when you said that I had this image. I had always wondered about that very point. <laughs> Um, because I always thought it was strange when you'd see some old uh, movie about the English hunt. Yes. And people would say, hello. hello. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it's strange. That, how did that work? But it, I never had uh, an answer to that. It would never resolve that little mystery in my own mind. So. Edison was not noted for his schooling. Yeah. I mean, he was, shall we just say, an early dropout. Yeah. And not noted for his manners. And he thought it was just his joke <laughs> on... Um, on his rival. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fascinating, fascinating. Okay, well, I appreciate that funny uh, sketch. So, um, what most interests you about linguistics? I mean, I, I, get, I get that um, your interest is across this full spectrum of how it is that um, human beings share meaning and all the different layers of technological and conventional structure that are between us sharing communication. I'm not so much surprised that we share meanings because humans are very social animals. They're, Chomsky, forgive me, imitative animals to a significant degree. But what does surprise me is how much variation there is across people, across children learning languages, across a, a language, a native language, across speakers of different languages, how much variation there is in getting to the same end. It's very convenient to notice what looks similar across languages, what looks similar across the processes by which children learn to talk, learn their native language. But if you actually look up close, and you spend a lot of time with children, as well as observing differences across languages, you're amazed by the ingenuity, as well as the, the effects of, in the case of individual children, of personality, on how we go about the learning, the acquisition of tasks. That fascinates me. That connects where we were uh, last in the little conference area about uh, this extension into becoming more richly present through creatively differentiating. That, 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 that is how I would define it in some respects, what, how you just did with respect to how ingenious um, and personalized children are in finding a way to express or extend themselves and what they're learning into. Right. It's a concept that I like to call language orienteering. Yeah, I noticed that I misspelled first one I read. No, actually, it's from a book I did called Growing Up With Language, uh -huh. How Children Learn to Talk. And in looking at how children go through this process of becoming linguistic beings, 
Uh, I had been raised on the conventional wisdom that we are biologically programmed to learn language, and essentially what happens is you get dropped into or born into a linguistic community, and then some switch is turned on that says, you are going to learn Athapaskan, Native American language, or you are going to learn Finnish, and you then go that route towards learning that language. What I found through much more careful observation is that, number one, children work very hard at the process of learning language. And sometimes they do it evidently, like practice that you can record. And sometimes it's not so obvious, but it's clear that it didn't just sort of come overnight. All right, what we find is that children, like any other adult being, like any other human being, work hard to make themselves understood. The problem with children is they don't yet have all the vocabulary, they may not have all the pronunciation apparatus, and they should not have all the syntax necessary to formulate those phrases or sentences that they wish to. So they get very ingenious, just like a person doing orienteering who maybe has a compass, maybe not, maybe has a couple matches in a plastic baggie, <laughs> maybe has some food, maybe not, and with that little bit of equipment, whatever you've got, has to find his or her way to the goal. Similarly, children, with whatever linguistic equipment they have at the moment, whatever expressive skills they have under their belt, have to figure out how to get meaning across. When you look at different children, you see they have a wide range of ways of doing this. So what this tells me about what's most important in language acquisition is that we come prepared to want to make ourselves socially understood. The apparatus, the linguistic structure you use to make that happen is interesting, yes, but the fact that we come driven to learn that apparatus and to manipulate that apparatus, however works for us at a particular point in language development, is what I find to be truly amazing. A uh, couple of intersections here. Uh, the work on affect. Which I, I think I briefly mentioned to you. Um, yeah, but how, affect, how the, the, these basic emotional precursory uh, spotlighting channels that that, run, that that focus attention for cognition to work inside of, and uh, the the way that the interest, excitement, and trains as a channel to work out this creative expression and why it's so important. Is, uh, is fundamental to what we're trying to understand and putting this thing together. So there's both sides of this, yeah. right? There's the kind of cognitive uh, understanding of it and the linguistic perspective, and then there's why is it that we're doing to do this, both the social uh, connectedness of human beings and how does that translate to this emotional, affective drive to do this. The child psychologist, Jerome Bruner, yes. used to describe language acquisition children as an overlay atop social interaction. And he said, first what comes is that drive for social bonds, both on the part of children and on the part of adults. One of the reasons that adults talk the way they do, so-called baby talk or child-directed speech, to young children in many, many societies, not all, but many, is the adult's need to feel socially connected with a being who doesn't yet talk or doesn't yet talk very much. So we as adults often mold the way we address children because of our need to feel I'm having a relationship with something, someone, who can't talk back again. So rather than being an implicit strategy to trying to make some pedagogical stairway for the child, we're actually um, uh, modulating ourselves to have more emotional connection yes, for that, our own that, sake. That's my read on so-called baby talk. Yeah. Now, there's certain things we do in baby talk that clearly have a pedagogical base. Right. Whether they're useful or not to the child is another issue. One of the things that doesn't, for example, we often repeat a, a sentence. We ask more questions. We speak more slowly. We speak more grammatically. Does speaking more slowly and grammatically help? Perhaps. Does repeating ourselves help? Maybe. Does asking more questions of a being that's not going to respond to you help? I doubt it. <laughs> One of the things that some adults do is they'll use long words and then define them. So they'll, or, or give a version of a definition. So you'll say something to a two-year-old. Oh, look at the Apatosaurus. That's a really nice dinosaur. 
hint, hint, Apatosaurus is a type of dinosaur, but I've used the word, so maybe you'll be more familiar with it when you see it in the children's book, when you see it on television, or whatever. One of the things we probably don't control that may or may not help draw children's attention is the level of pitch we use in addressing very young children. So, for example, statistically, women, some men, but a lot of women in many different cultures raise their pitch level in talking with young children. They also tend to undulate their, um, their, their line of melody much more. Studies have been done that suggest that that heightened pitch level and bringing, in essence, the set of vowel sounds which you make closer together rather than distributing them through the mouth helps attract a child's attention. And it helps them um, make the kind of distinctions that everything else is built on later. That's, That's the assumption. Yeah. The assumption is if you get their attention to the spoken language stream, they will be able to then focus more in on how to make distinctions between these clumps of things we call words, or different sounds, what's the difference between cat and cat, well, it's that initial sound. And that by getting them to attune to what we're saying, they will be more primed to use some of their innate apparatus to begin doing that um, butcher's job of separating out the pieces. Right, of the rhyming and the uh, humorous juxtapositions and other things yeah. that will create some uh, attraction to distinction. Although the rhyming tends to be useful a little later on. There's nothing wrong with reading the cat in the hat to a three-month-old, but the effects it's going to start having, we think, on that sense of sound distinctions is going to be much more important when you get to one, two, three. Why? For among other reasons, up until at least age six months, from all the evidence we have, I'm thinking particularly of people such as Patricia Cool's work and Peter uh, Jusick's work, uh, we don't have that real distinguishing ability neurologically to say, this is the set of sounds in my language, and I don't really hear the distinctions that another language makes but mine doesn't. Somewhere between 6 and 12 months, babies seem to really hone their abilities to distinguish the sounds that make a difference for meaning in their own language and then to gradually lose the ability to make distinctions between sounds that don't make a difference for their language. We know that rhyming depends on making a distinction for sound, making a distinction between sounds that make a difference for meaning in your language. So I would say the rhyming issue becomes far more important as children get a little older, as they start to get their phonemic, the basic sound distinction repertoire uh, under control which is really a, a, a two-year-old, a three-year-old um, event. Right. So, so once, they, once they've kind of uh, uh, formatted to the range of uh, sound in their particular language, and that they're using that as a base, and they can go on and make finer level distinctions through these subsequent uh, activities like rhyming and... Well, I'm not sure I'd call rhyming a finer level distinction, because once you have control over at least auditorily. In pronunciation, that's production, it's another mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. But at least auditorily, once you have control over the sounds that make a difference for meaning in your language, the phonemes, what you then have to learn is some of those metalinguistic skills, you know, the things that say, how do you use those distinctions you've learned to make? Or how do you then later, by the time you're four, five, or six, talk about those distinctions? How do you learn to say two words rhyme? So, for example, a three-year-old will be able to know that two words rhyme, but may not know the word rhyme, and may not be able to describe it metalinguistically as a process, but be able to participate in that process nonetheless, to make up more of those things. Yeah, even though they're not metalinguistic, even though they're not able to, uh, to articulate what that distinction is, yes. so they can begin to hear it. Indeed. That's beginning to create the developmental stairway towards being able right. to speak and read better and read and write and so forth. Right. And we have a fair amount of growing evidence that suggests the more children know their nursery rhymes, at least in American culture, in all probability, the faster they're going to break into reading. 
Because one of the things you have to do in reading is learn how to segment out those first letters, which largely, but not entirely, stand for different sounds. Or separate out those final letters. Hey, that's called rhyming. <laughs> and if you already have an ear for segmenting out and substituting, then when you see it visually, you've got a leg up over those people who may have heard some rhymes, but not particularly tuned into it. Now, having said that, it's very important to know some kids love rhymes. Other kids don't particularly. And you can get them to memorize um, Hickory Dickory Dock, the crackling of the, you know, the mouse ring of the clock, but they may not enjoy it. There are other kids who enjoy it enormously. Now, one of the ways you get to enjoy things enormously is by identifying with people, adults, older siblings, who enjoy it. So if you've got parents who are walking around t saying rhymes, making up rhymes, that becomes something that you are more likely to want to do yourself rather than, now child, it's time to go to bed, let's read some nursery rhymes. Right, the difference between the affective carrier and its influence and the get the kind of cognitive distinction of the yeah, the, the, the text. Yeah. The text. Good. So um <clears throat> the jewels of significance. Let's go into that. <laughs> what are the top five things um, that you think is most significant about your own work that that kind of drives you passes you? Uh to some extent, one has to ask this question now, in earlier parts of my research, but I'll address the ones for now. Okay, good. Uh, the thing that interests me most now, that I'm doing my research on at the moment, is the extent to which contemporary language technologies are or are not shaping the ways in which we speak and write. We know historically that to some extent, the relationship between spoken and written language has changed over time. We know that if you look at the history of the English language back in the days of 8th century, 9th century, 10th, and so forth, although there were very few people literate, literacy was largely used for encoding text that would subsequently be either recited aloud or read aloud. So the Bible was read aloud. There weren't many people to read it. And even in those famous monasteries in the Middle Ages, the monks were read to. I'm even going to assume that they were, you know, at least borderline literate. They knew how to copy, which doesn't necessarily mean you're literate. But let's say they were borderline literate. They were still read the Bible at meals. By the time you get to around Shakespeare's time, you've had printing or you know, late, well, essentially since 1450, but not much was printed, you have a changing attitude by the early part of the 17th century towards what writing is about. Writing comes to be a genre that stands by itself. You start developing ways of writing that are different stylistically from even formal speech. The ways in which you punctuate are no longer rhetorical punctuation, but so-called grammatical or logical punctuation, where in essence you're trying to look at the, the, the structure of a written sentence and put punctuation that makes sense for that, rather than rhetorical punctuation, punctuation that makes sense for speaking aloud. We put lots of pauses in, these days we put lots of commas in, that don't grammatically belong. Okay. That notion of there being a distinct written style lasted to my mind, up through about the middle of the, of the 20th century, when for a whole set of pedagogical reasons, when we were teaching people to write more informally, when journalism became uh, a model for teaching writing, that gradually we began to write informal speech. So we go from writing, encapsulating formal spoken language to be spoken aloud again, to writing to stand by itself People reading silently, which didn't happen initially. We used to read aloud. Everybody read aloud. To a period now where, yes, we write, but we largely write the way we informally speak. So then the question becomes, if that's a process that's been happening anyway, 
what are some of the new computer-based or mobile phone-based technologies doing to the way we write? And mobile phone-based technologies, I'm talking about texting, not speaking on the phone. All right, so there are a lot of um, worries in the popular media today, and I've had some of the same ones myself. Is email turning us into sloppy writers? Are we really all that bad in our spelling and in our grammaticality and our logic as it appears? Instant messaging, which is now for teenagers and young adults, heavily replacing what email was. And increasingly, as at least in the United States, businesses are finding uh, you could get instant turnaround if you replace your email system with an instant messaging system. Now, adults as well are using instant messaging systems. Similarly, in most of the rest of the world, although maybe starting now in the United States in a significant way, it remains to be seen, texting on mobile phones is becoming another way of writing. So the question is, are, is, is written language going to hell in a handbasket? Uh, are these ways of communicating, let's say on instant messaging, by teenagers, who also are, we hope, in school, are they affecting the kinds of written compositions they're turning in? Is this happening in college? Well, the data we have thus far on teenagers come largely from interviewing high school teachers. Because try to get a teenager to just hand over his or her IMs. Uh, it, it can be done, but it's very difficult. Okay. But what a number of teachers are saying is, you won't believe the kind of B slash C for because, or LOL for laughing out loud, we're seeing in the essays that are supposed to be edited. And some of the teachers are saying, tut tut, have to do something about it. And others are saying, well, we have to learn to go with the flow. Language changes. You can't control language change. There's nothing wrong with it. So let's just accept it. What I found in my research on instant messaging data from college students, which you can gather because they're of age and they can give their own permission and they're happy to do so, is that amazingly, the instant messaging is not as bad as we have described it as being. I'm just now looking at a corpus of 2,185 instant messaging terms and about 23 different conversations held between college-age students. And amazingly, there are very, very few spelling errors. Out of all those terms, and you know, maybe 20,000 words, 171 spelling errors. That astounded me. I expected to see lots. There's no spell check on instant messaging, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it will come. <laughs> but most people attend to it. All right, so very few errors. Similarly, there are lots of capitalizations, lots of periods. It's not that everybody uses it all the time, but there's an enormous amount of real attention to some of those sentence mechanics that people learned in school. Similarly, there are places in which, in spoken language, we use contractions all the time, I'm, your, doesn't, and so forth. Many, many, many of the writers of these I am conversations spell things out. I am, does not, you are. Now, if we're, these are supposed to be instant and fast, what's going on? My hunch is, what has happened is the current generation of college students overwhelmingly has learned to write at the keyboard. Because so many schools require that everything written be done through word processing. So we have trained a generation of hands to spell, not always perfectly, but better than we once thought, to capitalize, to write out uh, words that could be contracted, because in a formal essay you're not supposed to use contractions, right? <laughs> so it turns out that it's probably formal written pedagogy, that at least in the case of college students, is influencing their style of instant messaging rather than vice versa, which is astounding. And makes perfect sense. <laughs> it makes sense, but we did not anticipate it. Now, whether this is true of all universities, whether this will retain uh, validity as the current generation of high school students that's doing a lot of instant messaging, which today's college students didn't necessarily do. Are they going to just keep their habits up through college? We have to wait a few years right. and tap into the pool. But again. we can say, passing through this phase, that the influence of this particular modality of, of learning to write and communicate with the keyboard has affected their pattern or habit of expressing themselves and that that's carrying over 
Now, this should not surprise us if we look back at history. If you look at the effects that the typewriter at least potentially had on young children's writing, you'll find that sitting at a keyboard, rather than having to do something which is very hard for a six or seven year old, namely to hold a writing implement, uh, sitting at a keyboard generates more text. There were some studies done in the late 1920s, early 1930s of bringing typewriters, and those are great big clunkers in those days, into elementary schools and comparing the amount of text, the amount of writing, the number of words generated by children who were seated at keyboards and had learned how to type with age mates who were given the same assignment, the same sheet of paper, and asked to write by hand. The kids who were typing who were no smarter, had diff no different education, generated far more words than the people writing by hand. Similarly, when word processing first came in, you know, long before we had network computers, long before anyone outside of uh, ARPA was using uh, email, uh, we have seen we have studies that suggest simply sitting in a keyboard makes it easier to generate a lot of text than writing by hand. But again, if you look even farther back in history, that shouldn't surprise us. Because if you read some of the little side notes written by scribes in the Middle Ages, they will complain about how hard it is physically to write. Now, writing was harder then. You had to take a knife and put it in one piece of the parchment to keep from slipping. And then given the, um, the scripts that were available, Plus the writing surface, you had to, in essence, etch your letters in. They don't look that way now, but that's what you were doing. It was hard labor. Yeah, I would imagine there was some kind of middle-aged, uh, middle-aged uh, carpal tunnel syndrome <laughs> equivalent <laughs> from the rigorous attention to motor right. control that would be required to do that day after day after day. Or the equivalent of what I still have, the lump yeah. on my middle finger. Right, right. And I can always judge the age of a person in one of my classes by whether they have the lump. Uh -huh. If they're too old, they have the lump, and they didn't grow up typing. Fascinating, yeah. Um, I'm also very interested in how the, these technologies affect how, how we express ourselves. And so what you're saying is that, that there, there's some efficiency in the transmission of thoughts and ideas into words on paper that the uh, yeah, keyboard uh, and typewriter make possible that isn't as efficient by paper and pencil approaches that results in a greater throughput. However, However there are dangers. Yeah. The danger that um, such people as Henry James told us about is if you are not physically having to craft your own words, typically by hand yourself, it's very easy to pour out a lot of not terribly coherent writing. So I say Henry James told us because Henry James, at some points in his writing career, hired an amanuensis to take dictation, in this case, at a typewriter. And what he himself said is that there's a clear difference in the way I compose if I am having to sit down and literally write it out myself by hand you know, outside of Mark Twain trying it out, not being many people in the early days typed, then when I can speak aloud and someone else is writing it down. He said, my thought is much sloppier. If, I need, if I'm on deadline, I must learn to write myself, because otherwise I have to sit and edit all this stuff out again. But couldn't that be a, a, a result of his particular, I would think that would be highly individualistic. In his time, he learned to express himself by the constraint placed on how fast he could articulate right. this way. If you changed it for him, he's a bit disoriented. Somebody else who learned to compose and connect their thought process to their output process through a particular thing, I would think that they would kind of adapt on an individual um, basis. Maybe yes, maybe no. Cicero, we know, didn't uh, sort of write down his orations himself. He had Tiro, his scribe, write them down for him, and then he would memorize them and Deliver them. That's kind of the history of, of uh, kings and uh, I mean, people of power. Well, there's most a difference. Time, most Cicero was literate. Yeah. Cicero was literate. Royalty generally in Western Europe in the early days 
wasn't. <laughs> they couldn't have written if their lives depended on it. No, thank you. I hire people to do that. But for, isn't it true that for most of history, uh, people depended on somebody that acted as the mediator to and from the written form? People that were doing the uh, reading for them or the writing for them? Oh, I don't know if one can say through most of history. I mean, one thinks about the West and, I mean, Charlemagne learned to read after he had enough power to hire people to teach him. <laughs> and he didn't start out that way, but then decided it would be something that would be useful to know how to do. Mm -hmm. um, as for whether we have become cognitively different people, now that almost all of us have become typists, at least by the time we get to middle school, um, it's hard to tell. Do we compose differently? For example, my teenage son tells me, if I'm trying to sketch out a paper, I can't do it by hand. I must do it on a keyboard. On the other hand, although I spend hours of my day at a keyboard, if I really want to think through conceptually how to structure an analysis, I take a yellow pad, I take a pen, I go sit somewhere, and I outline, maybe because I grew up doing that. I'm a whiteboarder. <laughs> the, the computer is this great kind of one at a time thing, but it's not a great all at once thing. Now, the issue is, do today's uh, older teens and say people in their 20s really think differently at a keyboard than people in the 40s and 50s and above? How would we measure that? Because if you find that, let's say, 18-year-olds, statistically, are not writing what people 40 and above would consider to be logically, coherently structured argument, is it because of the keyboard, or is it because of our pedagogy that has, in the last 50 years, overwhelmingly said, just express what's in your mind. You know, don't worry about the mechanics. Don't worry so much about the logic. That will come, maybe, yes, maybe, no. I want to know what's in your head and in your heart. Stream of consciousness. Yeah, I'd like to hope it's a little better, but not always. Yeah. So if we have not taught people logical argumentation, and then that same generation, coincidentally, has grown up on the keyboard, what's the root of the problem? It's really hard to judge. It's really hard to judge. It would be nice to try to figure it out, but I'm not sure we have the control groups in order to do it. Right. So, so um, what is linguistics? What is the, the, the kind of definition that you work with when you say linguistics? Uh, scratch five linguists and you come up with five definitions. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> For me, Linguistics is the study of those different systems of representation, they may be spoken, they may be written, they may be signed, that enable us to communicate with other members of our social group in some mutually understandable way. So if I speak English and you speak English, we share an understanding of what are the sounds that go to make up our system. We share an understanding of what the words are and roughly, not exactly, but roughly what their meanings are. We roughly share an understanding of what constitutes a grammatical phrase, grammatical sentence. We share pragmatic uh, understandings, when it's okay for me to call you by your first name, when I need to use a title, uh, what is rude behavior, what's not rude behavior, and so forth. And that's what is a language. So languages are those things which are exemplified by those things we call languages. So how about a, um, a brief sketch of the major milestones of thought? And there I just need some help on where you want me to start. What is what are current theories of linguistics? Uh, historically, historically, go. Let's do a brief run, you know, just headline view. All right. Of uh, the kind of history stairway of linguistics. All right. And wherever you're comfortable is fine. Okay. 
depending upon the needs of a particular culture, linguistics has come to mean different things. For example, we're all fond of quoting some of the early Roman grammarians, um, Priscian, for example. We talk about Priscian and Pharaoh and their grammars, and weren't they great? And we see people talked about grammar and language even back then. Why? The reason they talked about grammar, Priscian is probably the nicest example, is because the language, in that case the Latin language, is dying. You had people who were speaking other languages. In the case of Priscian, he was in Constantinople, a.k.a. Istanbul, <laughs> and he found they're speaking Greek, but they don't know Latin anymore. So he wrote out this long, detailed grammar to teach people Latin, to teach them better Latin, not because in our heart we think there should just be a grammar of every language. Similarly, when you get to the West, we have people who are interested in writing Latin grammars, where then they put English grammars but in Latin molds. Why were they interested in doing that? Because Latin was not a native language of people in the West. It wasn't in France, and it definitely wasn't in England. So we have a lot of Latin grammar being developed, and people talking about cases and declensions and conjugations and all these formal categories, not because it's just inherently interesting, which it is to linguists these days, but because there was a use for it. It gave people, school teachers, a way of teaching the language. So linguistics was less a, a, a kind of a abstract analysis, uh, under science of understanding all of this, yeah, and more and, of a practical, pragmatic, uh, and every, pedagogical tool. And, you know, and linguists like to believe that linguistics is just this discipline unto itself, just as a lot of mathematicians, particularly pure mathematicians, say, I'm absolutely not interested in application. A lot of physicists say, sure. I just love physics. But, you know, the reason physics spread in this country is because the United States government put an incredible amount of money into the endeavor, not because in their hearts they all wanted to study the physical universe. Okay, moving along, you find a person such as René Descartes talking about a trait of language, namely its uniqueness to human beings. Now, Descartes wasn't interested particularly in the structure of language. He was interested in what it meant to be human and how one distinguished humans from other from other beings, and he took language as one of the main criteria. Noam Chomsky, following Descartes, in a book called Cartesian Linguistics, takes exactly the same tack. He's interested, he Chomsky in this case, in what does it mean to be human. Take another school of linguistics, the so-called neo-grammarians, at the end of the 19th century, primarily in Germany, but spreading to a fair amount of Western Europe. They had a very clear, simple question. They began by asking, how does German relate to Sanskrit? Now, why would you want to know how German relates to Sanskrit? Because there was a whole move in the second half of the 19th century in Germany to talk about the sophistication of the Germanic people. You had the brothers Grimm, who in addition to writing down fairy tales as a way of saying, we have a history. It wasn't just they wanted to amuse children. These were scary stories. They wanted to say, we have an oral culture. We can encapsulate it. And they wanted to say, we have a sophisticated language. They wrote a grammar of German. And they and their ilk, people who followed in their stead, were interested in showing that historically, German is related to a very sophisticated language, Sanskrit, that is associated with a very sophisticated culture, namely you know, northern Indic culture. And therefore, we must be pretty good, too. Okay. From there, we move to another motivation for studying language called structuralism. There were schools of structuralist linguistics in the early part of the 20th century, in, well, particularly in, um, in, uh, in the UK, you know, then England, <laughs> and in the United States for different reasons. The Brits were extremely interested in understanding how languages around the world worked to aid the colonizing endeavor. If you can't understand and make yourself understood to the people you're looking to 
dominate, then you're in trouble. Okay. Americans had a slightly different motivation for looking at the structure of languages. Namely, there were a number of really good-hearted people, started with the German Franz Boas, who came to the United States, and started looking at the kinds of languages used here, which weren't into European languages, looked totally different. Uh, Westerners, missionaries in, in particular, had said, well, these are bastardized languages. They don't even have an ablative case. Therefore, the, as Latin does, therefore, these people must not have good minds. Therefore, it's okay to conquer them. It's okay to take their lands. It's okay to kill them. So you have a number of people who begin the American anthropological tradition who say, no, 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 it's not okay. If you actually looked at their language, you'll find it to be very sophisticated, in many cases much more sophisticated than what you find in modern Indo-European languages. So what is the first thing Franz Boas does? The same thing that the Brothers Grimm did. They wrote down oral stories. They said there's a rich cultural heritage here. They constructed grammars, the same thing the Brothers Grimm did. They said, look at the sophistication of Navajo. It's incredibly complex. You think speakers of this language are primitive people, which had been a myth in the late 19th century? They can't possibly be. And it was a way of enfranchising people and acknowledging their humanness, which in a very different way is what Chomsky tried to do with a very different outlook on how to think about language beginning in the 1950s. He said, we're all human beings. And therefore, since no one was questioning the humanity you know, of Western, uh, the Western world and, quote, civilized people, which means has writing systems, uh, he then went a step farther and said, each one of us has the same humanity. And yes, that's connected with his politics, although he roundly denies it. But it has to be innately given unto us in order for each of us to have those linguistic abilities, that linguistic potential, in order for each of us to be what he called an ideal speaker hearer within us, in order for each of us to be able to make grammaticality judgments, in order for each of us to learn language, and so forth. And then he had a very different set of issues, namely, I want to know what's going on in our humanness, not necessarily in our mind, because he wasn't into uh, neuropsychology, we didn't know enough when he got started for him to get into it. But he wanted to know who are we as people and what is the incredible complexity of the grammar, the way you put words together in sentence, sentences that we must account for. And since you couldn't have learned it, so he claimed, it must be innate and it must be part of our human makeup. Right. This is the point uh, Terence Deacon and Lumber Brothers are really challenging from different dimensions, like the co-evolution of language in the brain, that the language has evolved to adapt itself to, to, the learn, to how learnable it is to a child's mind. And indeed... The language has, has evolved as an extra brain uh, collective possession to fit what's most learnable by the child that's developing it. But there's a more modern version of something like that hypothesis yeah. in the work of some people working on language acquisition. So, for example, if you look at the work of Michael Tomasello or Elizabeth Bates, uh, they have said, we need to shift the discussion from, is language acquisition all just unfolding what was innately within you? And you just turn on the, um, the Iroquois or the... Um, the, the French switch. But meaning there's some universal grammar underneath it that yeah. differentiates depending on what environment you're in, Indeed. like we were talking about Indeed. earlier. Or the other, you know, polar opposite was, you know, sort of the, the locking and empiricist uh, position, which today we call the social interactionist position, which says, yeah, you must have something in you, lock me not gone that far, but your interaction with other people, that social exchange, that language being an overlay atop social interaction, as Jerome Berner described it, is really what's most important for us to look at. Today, there are people who are saying, let's step back from those two discussions. Both of those must, positions must have a grain of truth in them. But we also need to ask, does the brain change as we learn language? And do those changes in the brain then make possible yet different sorts of acquisitions. So is this a symbiotic process in the individual? Forget about in the species. Is this a symbiotic process in the individual that we really need to look more carefully at? 
Do we really know how this works, assuming it's true? I don't think so. We're just starting to get some exciting possible hypotheses. But I think very definitely, as we're learning, the brain evolves not just in neonates, not just through early childhood, but I'm pleased to hear the brain evolves as we become adults. We still grow brain cells. I'm thrilled to hear this. Um, then what does that tell us about how we learn? and how language comes to be, and how much of it is innate, and how much of it is social, and how much of it is, you know, phylogenetically, uh, sorry, um, excuse me, how much of it is ontogenetically an evolution? It seems like any way you cut through this, we come back to what an amazing power, capacity for learning we humans have. We do. And what we need to keep in mind is, having been amazed, we need to look at variation, and we need to honor variation. I mean, there are all kinds of schools of thought. Howard Gardner is a good example. Um, Steinberg is another example who talk about uh, different styles of learning and talk about different components of the brain and, and different kinds of intelligences. I'm not sure I want to go that far, but we do know that children are biologically different from one another, some of it being genetically induced. So for example, there's pretty good evidence that language disabilities are heritable. There's also growing evidence that even styles of language acquisition, are you late in starting to talk? You're perfectly normal, but are you late in starting to talk? Or are you early? Or you're just right for you, and all of a sudden, right. an external imposition. Yeah, but, but, but if you just want to take the time scale, there seems to be at least some genetic correlate if you look back, back to previous generations. I have people who come to me, since I'm a specialist in language acquisition, and say, oh, I'm all worried. My two-year-old isn't putting words together yet. And I say, okay, tell me about, let's say it's a he, because this may be more heritable in males than females. We don't know. Tell me about his father. Oh, yeah, he was slow, too. And his grandfather was slow before, but they all turned out fine. Isn't there kind of a <laughs> psychological um, bias towards trying to, to find some explanation that, that, that eases the If you're a parent and you have a two-and-a-half-year-old who isn't putting words together, you'll do anything to figure out, is there something wrong? Yeah. So is there anything problematic with trying to find an explanation? No, because often if you can indeed establish that there seems to be at least some genetic correlation, you're going to worry a lot less. Well, yeah, that's the nature of uh, shame, is we look for a definition to ease it. Uh, yes. Right? So that's the, that, the affect, once it's kicking, it, we're trying to find some way out of it. Right. But to go back to, okay. but to, go back to differences, there are some kids who really are not as social as others. Mm -hmm. They're not autistic. They're not problematic, they don't have Asperger's syndrome, they're just not as social. I mean, we've known some kids love to be hugged and some don't, and that doesn't mean they're warped, it just means they don't love to be hugged. So what does this mean for us? Maybe their style of acquiring language is not going to be as socially based as those who are the more social babies. Great. I should learn your sign language. <laughs> As time there is eight minutes left. Gotcha. As you know, in uh, I could bounce around a little bit here now. I want to talk about, as, as best we can, the um, collision, the intermix of these different linguistic systems, these different systems of language, um, the Roman alphabet, the Latin written language, and the English oral language, and how those mix together to become the English writing system. If you look at the history of the Roman alphabet, or even back before then, of the Greek, or even back before then, 
the Phoenician consonantal alphabet. Well, no, that same, those same systems spread to a number of different spoken language groups and in many cases got adapted to fit what that particular spoken language was like. We know, for example, that when the Roman alphabet spread north to those uncivilized Germanic tribes, it morphed into the runic system. Actually, there were a number of different runic systems. But the Germanic languages don't have the same phonemic or sound structure system as Latin did. So, for example, there's a th and a th in Germanic languages, which isn't in Latin. So one had to create a new visual symbol called the thorn, <laughs> which was used in runes and then later got borrowed into Old English because speakers of what was to become English, you know, the Angles and the Saxons, the Jews and the Persians, they came from these areas. And whether they brought the writing systems, their cohorts who, and their colleagues who came later brought some runic representation. So what we end up doing is adding in some symbols or throwing out some symbols if they don't make a one-to-one -one match with at least the consonants in the language. We know, for example, that the earliest English that we think we have some evidence of was written in runes. Okay. Now I said the consonants we make up symbols for. What about the vowels? Because it's the vowels that very heavily cause the problem in English. We didn't make up lots of new vowel systems. There was one, it's called the ash, you know, pronounced a. Ah. So for example, in Old English, you had a word like fat, written with this thorn symbol that sort of looks like an overgrown P, and this a, ah, which is a combination of an a and an e, and then a t. Okay. Over time, we dropped out some of those added symbols. They either came from runes or were created within um, you know, England itself, and we ended up with basically the Latin alphabetic system. Why? Because many of the texts in England in the Middle Ages period were written in Latin. Writing down English, some was done, a lot of poems and riddles, <laughs> um, some stories, you know, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and so forth, but a lot of what was written was more church-related, and therefore written in Latin. Not necessarily good Latin, by the way. This notion that we have a knowledge of Latin, that the priests all spoke Latin, is probably poppycock. Uh, they spoke some bastardized version of it, and they had the letters. All right. So, initially, the uh, beginnings of writing, as you're saying, are, are primarily in Latin. Yes, the majority of the texts were written in Latin. So it's not surprising that since that orthography was what was being used um, for writing the Latin text, that it would also be used for the English text. But there's another kicker to this as well, namely, what kinds of type fonts did the early printers in England have? Caxton, the first English printer, came from the Netherlands. What he brought with him were the type fonts for Dutch. So not, and Latin, because obviously Latin texts were being used. So you didn't have an a, and you didn't have a th, and to carve these things, you know, took someone who was a really good metalsmith. So why bother? Why not simply use the type fonts that you have, which is exactly what happened. Right. So yeah. even though in manuscripts, some of these symbols might still have been used, once printing really starts becoming pervasive, they had no choice but to drop it. So, one of the uh, interesting issues to us in this space is we have this, um, it, it, let me make a characterization of it and you can push around on it. Right. We have the um, Roman Empire spreading out the use of written Latin as its nervous system of sorts to be able to communicate in some way by writing throughout its, uh, its various areas. And the, um, in England, the uh, church, mm -hmm. the uh, residual uh, merchant system that's connected to Europe, the Latin is the power language, the language of the people in power. Yes, okay. but, but, but <laughs> uh, 
Lang Latin is the language of the church, and the church serves royalty. So to the extent you have to write something that has to be sent out of your kingdom, putting it in Latin makes a certain amount of sense. However, um, people didn't necessarily, in, in royal situations, send a lot of written documents. We really have an oral society throughout the Middle Ages, and in some ways up through you know, the early Renaissance in England. Yes, there's writing, but things are done orally. An oral argument is how you present yourself. The education system throughout the Middle Ages and into the early modern period is done through reading texts aloud, you know, the famous book chained to uh, the pulpit. But you then might get your own copy of books as printing becomes available, or you had a lot of scribes just doing a lot of copying in Oxford and Cambridge. But still, you presented yourself orally. You had disputations. In fact, if you look at early education in the United States throughout the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, you have lots of oratory contests. Education is heavily oral. Written exams didn't begin until almost yesterday. It was all done orally. So this notion of everybody has to put it in writing, and Latin is the language of doing it, may be a little bit of a stretch because you have to, have to ask how many people were writing how much as opposed to speaking. So let's talk about speaking then for a moment. Okay. Um, relative to the church and the merchants and the kings and the, of Europe, right. what was the, how prevalent was Latin as an oral language then? To the best of my knowledge, largely non-existent. People didn't speak much Latin. I mean, there's, spoke, there's all this talk about language, Latin being the lingua franca of the Mediterranean area and then spreading out with the clergy. But we do know, J.R. Oust's work is probably a good place to begin, that the clergy in general didn't know much Latin. They were you know, reading the masses in Latin? Well, you're assuming. Well, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, to some extent, to the extent that Latin represents, um, the, the Latin alphabet, Roman alphabet, represents the sounds of Latin. You could say, well, it's not that hard to decipher. Ecclesiastical Latin, by the way, is pronounced differently from classical Latin, and we really don't know how classical Latin was pronounced. We do know that there's an awful lot of stumbling and mumbo jumbo that was going on, particularly as you get from, you know, um, you know, Archbishop of Canterbury on down to the local parish. There was less and less knowledge of Latin. The people didn't understand Latin. So if you read a little bit, the people just stood there because they didn't sit in those days and took it. The reason that you have all those stained glass windows in the cathedrals is both so the people, the hoi polloi, can learn the stories. But you know what? A lot of the clergy didn't know terribly much more. Okay? Spoken Latin, I don't know to what extent one can say it was largely, it was heavily used. Certainly there were people who could speak in Latin. I would assume that Sir Thomas More could speak in Latin. Could Locke, who sometimes wrote in Latin, sometimes in English, speak in Latin? I don't know. We know, for example, that he wrote in Latin so as to be able to be read and published on the continent because there weren't that many people in his day who found English worth learning. And as a result, the British presses didn't publish books that they knew wouldn't sell enough copies. So, so it's a Europe, Europe's common second language. For reading. For reading. And by common, here we're talking about the educated elite, yes. which you could probably need two people's sets of fingers and toes to count, but not enormously more. So we have this writing system coming in that has 24 letters, and we have this English spoken system, which has 40 plus 40 distinct sounds right. right over a period of so many hundreds of years between the 800 
AD and the 17th, 18th century, the other side of the printing press stabilizing it. These two systems map onto each other in a certain way that coheres into what underlies the writing systems of today. Right. right. What can you say about that, that process of how these two grew into each other? How it is that, why didn't we develop uh, additional letters? Was it trying to preserve the fact that we wanted to get, <laughs> we wanted to keep Latin? Well, we, why didn't we develop? Why didn't we um, try to maintain a, a better uh, phonetic correspondence? All right. All uh, the the question has two parts, and I'll give two answers. Good. We originally, when nobody was sort of running the store, developed in some case by borrowing from runes or by taking a d D symbol in uh, Latin and sticking a line on it, seemed to be called an ev, okay, to represent the the sound in a word such as that. We did, or there was a win sound, you know, that was this funny looking character that's still used in Middle English, but drops out by the time you get to early modern English. Drops out, I think, largely because we didn't have a set of type fonts that could easily represent those symbols. You'd have to make some new ones. You didn't need them for the Latin texts you were printing. They hadn't come over with Caxton. So because a number of people had already been writing that thorn, th, with a th, that actually had started in, in Old English times. Not everybody used that runic symbol. They just dropped out the extra stuff that you needed to distinguish English from Latin. Okay, so to some extent, it's why bother with two systems? Because the only people who were writing probably knew Latin anyway. So you don't want to have to learn two different sets of orthographies. And, and TH does just fine for the and the. We really don't have a, a problem. If you know how to speak the word think and speak the word that, you don't care if you write them both in the beginning with the TH. It's irrelevant. The vowels never got some help. They were ambiguous to begin with. All right. So we have a system that works for Latin, works for English, that we have type fonts for. And remember, type fonts are very expensive. It's not simply a question of, we'll just cut another one. And because in the printer's tray, you need to have, what, 50 E's? Uh, we'll cut 50 more of them. No, there, there's a cost involved in this. So economics probably fed into the mix as well. But then there's the question of, well, why haven't we solved the problem since then? Why haven't we had spelling reform? Let's pause there. I want to come back to that as a, okay. in a subsequent point. I appreciate where you're going with that. And, and that's a okay, we'll get to that when you're story. ready. So you're suggesting that there was, on one part, a kind of a bias towards Latin, or to Latin, and on the other part... For printing, for printing. As, as well as for copying manuscripts. That's what people know okay. how to do. Right. Bias towards Latin in bias general. Latin in I'll general. take that. And then um, there's the uh, economics associated with uh, having enough printable char printing characters um, to cover what was previously done by hand right. in adding these additional characters. So they began to pair bond these uh, letters in strange ways. That, that, that is my assumption. Was I there? Could I? No, I understand. I understand. But, but my assumption is, who would bother? We do making additional uh, characters for two reasons. First, um, you would then have to have two printers trays because you don't want to say, "Ah, oh, I'm just going to pick the ev out of this one, but use the main tray for everything else." And number two. Um, Why not just simplify? Since people have been simplifying in manuscript intermittently for centuries anyway. So you're not doing anything totally radical by eliminating those characters. It's also important to know that there were many dialects, both of Old English, but particularly of Middle English. Transportation was not the easiest thing in the world. And you really did have different spoken styles, and you had different writing conventions. So if you had, you know, the Southeast Midlands area, you know, what was London and then became a metropolis, 
that tended, and I don't know if this is true, but let us just say they tended not to be so fixated on using some of these non-Roman alphabetic characters then in their manuscript writing, then why not just ditch them entirely? There was, there was no reason to keep Like them. I said, nobody was minding the store. Yes. <laughs> and that's the key point, right? No, it was, and uh, like in the conversation with uh, Deacon about language, whether there's some evidence that the, the language uh, survives by how well it's learnable by the children. That's how it you know, reproduces. Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no, because children will rise to the occasion of, we'll start with spoken language, of the spoken language they have. So there are languages that have, you know, take Finnish, for example. It has all these different cases. English basically has, we used to call it the nominative case, you know, or the subject position, and an object position. But we have precious few words like him and her and them that even bother taking these separate endings. So that part's easy to learn for English. A bear to learn for Finnish, Russian, Greek, Sanskrit, they're not so easy either. People rise to the occasion. They learn them. It's what it means to become a speaker of your language. You may not learn them all by the time you're five. As Chomsky would tell us, language learning is complete. There are certain kinds of distinctions that really are harder, takes longer to learn. Similarly, with writing systems, depending upon how much stake you have in learning a system, if you have the opportunity and the drive, you'll learn it. People when learn the, Chinese. When was the first time in history that you know of that somebody said they, we need to develop a writing system that's um, optimally learnable for our children? Develop the writing system to fit the... or make a main priority in the design of the writing system that's the learnability of it um, for our children. I don't know exactly when it started, but it started in England. In the United States, we call it a version of magic spelling, mm -hmm. which means essentially write as phonemically as you know how. And there's some systems, I don't remember the name of it, you'll, you'll need to, to check it, where they developed a, a, a pedagogical system for spelling things using the letters we have. And maybe some people have put in some new squiggles, I haven't looked at this, but someone will know, uh, to represent all or almost all the sounds of spoken English. Uh, initial teaching alphabet, sorry. Right. The initial teaching the alphabet. Is. Okay. And uh, is that used? Not particularly. Is it useful? I don't think so. I don't think so because what you end up doing is teaching children to read once and then you pull the rug out from under them and you say, oh, excuse me, that's not really the way we write. This is how you Got do a it. a big transitional barrier. Later. Indeed. And the same sort of thing goes for a number of the different pedagogies for teaching cursive script. There are different pedagogies out in use in the United States, not in many places, because very few people teach handwriting anymore. But in the few places that do do it, they say, well, how about we teach how to make each of the letters in cursive script, but separate it out from the other, the same as you do in print. And then you learn after you've done all that, how to put them together, how to put in the ligatures, which to me is a ridiculous way to go about life because once you've gotten people comfortable putting spaces between letters, then you say, sorry, we have to do this all over again. Similarly, in the United States, there are many, many school systems that say what we really want to foster is what we have called magic spelling. It's not the initial teaching alphabet. It's just write however it works for you. And sometimes that means leaving out vowels. So, for example, many, many uh, children in learning to write, if they're told, do what you want, will leave out a lot of vowels. The vowels are hard. So it sort of looks like a consonantal alphabet <laughs> for many kids. And then gradually you start putting in vowels. Uh, being, too many. Get them able to express with greater distinction what's going on inside of them and then Indeed. build up the... Is this know. a good plan? I believe not, because what you then do is your bait and switch to kids and say, sorry, that's not how we spell these words. And you start telling kids when they are eight and nine years old that, whoops, you've got to do your spelling system all over again. But we're it's also starting to work... Traditional barriers that all these systems yeah. have. Because, but but let, let's step back. Before we go into this, this connects okay. up with the whole the history of spelling thing and, and what have you. Before we go to that, I'm going to come back again and say, all right, so we have this 
24 character mm -hmm. initially uh, alphabet system right. and this 40 plus sound English system. Right. And over a period of about a thousand years, they kind of merge into one another. Although they were pretty close even at the beginning. The Roman alphabet is not all that different, you know, give or take largely a couple of consonantal sounds and maybe one vowel from what English ended up with. So it didn't solve the vowel problem. The thing you have to remember about English is the pronunciation of a lot of those vowels has shifted over time. Mm -hmm. The spelling system got royally messed up in many ways, largely through the so-called Great Vowel Shift that took place sometime between about 1400 and 1600, about the death of Chaucer and you know roughly Shakespeare's time, where the grapheme sound correspondence got done away with. Plus, there were sound distinctions in older English that we didn't, that we no longer had. So there was greater degree of predictability in that matching than we have now. And the problem wasn't that we didn't match up sounds with the orthography, with the alphabet, with those 24 characters. The problem was there wasn't such a great match to begin with, but then the language changed, especially the vowel system. Right. If we go back to, to, to the Greeks and Romans, how many sounds were in their spoken language? I don't know. <laughs> uh, was there a better match? This is what I do know. All right. If you look at the early stages of Greek writing, we know probably around 7th century BC there was trade going on between the so-called archaic Greeks, you know, so the tail end of the archaic period, just before you get into the classical right. period, and the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were great seafarers. And we know at some point the so-called consonantal alphabet of the Phoenicians was borrowed. Consonantal alphabet, meaning it is an alphabet, you just don't put the vowels in. You may put some dots in, but you don't largely write the vowels. We know that at some point around the 7th century BC, maybe a smidge earlier, there was an adaptation of some of those consonants from the Phoenician system to represent Greek vowels or other sounds that are in Greek that weren't in the Semitic languages, because the Semitic languages and the European have very different sound systems. My assumption is that the match at that moment in time between the graphemes and the sound system was reasonably close. But then Greek changes over time, though the graphemic structure, the alphabet, is conservative. Alphabets tend to be very conservative. Spelling systems tend to be very conservative. What? A lot of inertia. <laughs> There's an incredible amount of inertia. There have been more attempts to revise English spelling than one can shake a stick at. George Bernard Shaw gave a large part of his estate to somebody who would redo the English spelling system. It failed. There were attempts in the United States in Woodrow Wilson's era to revise English spelling. It failed. Why did it fail? Because it's adults who have already learned the system to whom you are saying, now we have to switch. Now you have to learn all of you. The kids will learn whatever we teach them. Plus the obsolescence of all The obsolescence of all those books. Why is it that the Japanese, time after time, have resisted doing away with their basically tripart writing system, the kanji or the characters, and the two syllabic systems, the kana? Because they will tell you to be Japanese is to be able to read the writing system. That's our, those are our texts. That is our heritage. If we put it in what's called romaji, or romanizing the language, that's not us. That's not who we are. You're taking away a piece of, of what it means to be Japanese. We're not going to do it. Similar things happen with spelling. It's a grand scale QWERTY. <laughs> yes, it was a mistake, but here we have it, and I'm not going to give it up. Right, and the fact that 60% of our 12th graders read below proficiency. 68% of our but the question players. is, to what extent is that the fault of the alphabet? It may or may not be, but you're going to have to prove it rather than assume it. You're going to have to ask, why is it that some people learned this terribly complex system, and that historically have learned this terribly complex system, 
and others are not. And there may be two categories of people who are having problems. First, there are people who have some kind of learning difference or learning disorder, depending on how you want to describe right. it, That's, that makes it hard to learn to read any system or, and or that makes it hard to read an alphabetic system that doesn't have a clear one-to-one -one match between the graphemes and the sounds. Well, we know that if, it, if there isn't a clear match... It's harder. It's, it's definitely harder. But how much harder? it harder? takes some degree it takes, more brain time to process it, it. It takes more time. And that there's a direct correspondence in the stutter right. that we hear in the articulation of the voice of a developing reader and the stutter is corresponding to where there are knots of confusion and ambiguity in the code. But you know, learning how to pick up a stylus, a pen, a pencil, mm -hmm. and control it is hard. Learning how to drive a car and to keep it going straight is hard. Does that mean it's not learnable? No, but here's the thing, right? This is, <laughs> this is a technology. This is as much as driving a car. Of course it's a technology, and it may not be the technology that is best suited, but one has to ask first, is the technology as much a part of the problem as we think it is, or is it a problem for some people? Which doesn't make it a good technology, it just means maybe we're stuck with it. Or is that technology so awful that we just have to uproot the population and say we're going to do it differently? To wit, you take, for example, the writing of Turkish. Before Ataturk, you wrote Turkish in the Arabic script. It was an alphabet, but a different alphabet. Ataturk said, we're modernizing, folks, and everybody is going to have to learn to write the new script, which is an adaptation of the Roman script. It has a few extra doodads and curl cues added on because Turkish is really not an Indo-European language. But everybody who was going to read had to learn an entirely new script. How did he manage that? He was Ataturk. <laughs> How would we manage that in the United States? I don't think there's anybody with that clout to carry it off. A president sure as shooting can't. As evidenced by Roosevelt. <laughs> it just can't happen. But before we go to why we can't change it, okay. I think it's important to understand what's going on. Right. But, the, but let me come back to the issue of how many people do we expect to learn the system? And is it basically learnable? Again, assuming we don't have learning differences. Well, if we say 60% of our high school graduates are, are not reading, reading but we don't know that's the fault of the alphabet. No, we don't. But we know that reading is a technological process that involves the alphabet. But have we looked at the math skills? Have we looked at how much they know about who's president of the United States? Have we looked at whether... This, this is, <clears throat> um, the, it seems to me that the, the processing involved here is different. Of course the processing is different, but mathematics is all... I mean, let's, let's just focus on mathematics. Mm -hmm. Is it abstract skill? Yes, but it happens in an entirely different timescape. In order to read, this construction process has to happen much faster than we can consciously, volitionally think about. Okay, and I don't know enough about abstract, Whereas math, about the mental processing of math to comment on it, it right? but what I do know mm -hmm. is that many, 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 many I don't know what percent. I'm going to make a guesstimate, but I really don't know. 70%, 80%, 90% of the people who, by the time they are in the 12th grade, really can't read, also are not doing so well in math either. Right. Well, the... the for and I'm not sure this because they can't read the math text. No, no, I think <laughs> this is effective. The, the children that struggle long with learning to read actually become ashamed of how they're learning. And indeed that can and happen. And that, that generalizes. And indeed that can happen. But I would just like to suggest that we carefully think about what percent of the variance, what percent of the problem is the alphabet, and what percent of the problem is something else, only because we know what we're addressing. Because if you addressed, if we consider what that something else is, if you simply, you know, what if the dream came through and we got a truly phonetic alphabet, you know, somebody came Never down and said, but let's just <laughs> say it happened. Right. There are two problems. One is, that may not solve the reading problem for some significant number of the people who don't read. Some it will, 
I don't know what percent it was. We're probably the same guys who are not learning math. If we okay, if we said that there's a spectrum, right? I mean, right yeah. now, one of the I think one of the most interesting theories is is that there's a processing uh, frequency, the frequency of processing distinctions, mm -hmm. right? Which is which connects phonemic distinctions, phonemic right. awareness, all the way through the assembly that results in this virtually heard or actually spoken stream. There's a processing frequency thing, and that. People have different processing frequencies. They have developed different processing frequencies in the environments that they're growing and developing in. All right. But that still doesn't establish that the alphabet is not doable. Because if you simply look at how many millions upon millions of not necessarily very smart people have learned the alphabetic code, at least it's a doable job. We also need to remember... What if we found out that 60% of people that try to drive cars had fatal accidents? That their lives got mangled up in cars because well they do because we're bad drivers. But <laughs> that sixty percent, we would say, "What? Well, we better redesign these cars. We better think about this." And indeed, we should, which is why we have airbags, and we should have had them sooner. Which is why we should do a number of things. But the economy got in the way. We know how to design an airbag a long time before sure. cars legally had to have them. We knew how to put in seat belts long before you legally had to have them on. So there, it's the economy driving us. It has nothing to do with... Yeah, the inertia of what's established. All right, so let me take the inertia issue. Again, assume the dream came true, and we redid the English alphabet, and we made it a phonetic alphabet. Right. What are you going to do as language changes over time, and the pronunciation no longer matches the graphing? In 100 years, in 200 years, you're going to say, whoops, we have to change again. Because language pronunciation does change. It, it takes longer. But 500 years from now, if there still is... If you'd like to have a conversation <laughs> about how to solve this problem, I'd love to do that with you. I really would. But I don't think it goes by ever developing any kind of static system of correspondence for exactly the reasons you're talking about. The question is, is there a possibility of creating a third level of registered, overlaid... Uh, orthography that connects right. sound and, and, gra and graphemes in such a way that we can actually modify them over time without changing spelling and without changing the alphabet. Well, here's a proposal. <laughs> here's a proposal. Yeah. The Japanese do it, and I believe the Chinese do as well. But right. I know a little bit more about the Japanese system. If you look at, at early readers for Japanese kids, you will find real kanji characters, and sometimes these hiragana and katakana written out as part of the main text. And then written on top, in smaller type, are some of these syllabic representations. Because the, sy the syllabic um, systems are very easy to learn in Japanese. You know, there aren't that many, you know, kaki kuke ko, mami mimi mo, and so forth. And there's a symbol for each of them. You learn them, you're done. And that corresponds to everything in the spoken language, almost. What they have is this little, it's like training wheels. Really? Absolutely. And they've done a version <laughs> of that. For oh. Chinese readers as well, for uh -huh. learning to read, where I believe it's an alphabetic system that's used, pinyin, but you'll have to check on that. Don't trust me on the Chinese. But for, you know, for the training wheels for learning to read Japanese, they're doing it for the kan because people don't know the kanji yet. The kids haven't learned. It takes 12 years of schooling to learn the basic almost three, two or 3,000 kanji you're going to have to know to basically essentially read a newspaper. It takes years and years and years and years. But kids have to start to read something. And they don't know all the characters yet. They know a couple, but not many of them. Not enough to read a children's story that we would have for first graders here. So they put this set of training wheels on top. Now, if you want a system that has some version of an alphabetic representation that's more phonemic, a one-to-one -one correspondence, as long as you have the spelling system that I think we're largely stuck with. I agree. You can put that in children's readers. I have no problem with that. But if you put those in lieu of the way children are going to have to encounter the real printed word, you're doing the bait and switch on them, which is going to make life much, much harder. Yeah, no, I understand. This is fascinating. We do have to have another conversation. <laughs> We're open to it about just this sure. tra training wheels for literacy. How can we do this? Okay. How can we build a ramp 
that isn't so uh, static and mechanical. They can actually come up and come down. And, and I'm not, and, yeah, and, I'm not and, the expert on it, but I know. I, I know what exists in Japan. I believe I know what's in China. And I think there are ways of not boxing ourselves into the corners that an awful lot of the attempts, the magic spelling, the international teaching, the IT initial systems, teaching, yeah. Ben Franklin's new alphabet, Noel Webster's yeah. uh, revised yeah. spelling. Well, uh, some of it took. 50. <laughs> <laughs> Theater, anyone? Yeah. But, you know, a lot of it didn't. Yeah, most of it didn't. Right. Uh, right. That, mean, that's called a lot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and uh, my favorite, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, death of uh, spelling reform. Yeah. Well, our point with the children of the code is to, is to draw attention to the fact that I'm amazed that you obviously you're very savvy to this, but we meet with a lot of reading scientists. They have never really they talked about it, but they haven't really got the fact that, and they're getting it, mm -hmm. that we have these children, the three, four, five years old, are coming into this writing system. Mm -hmm. They're emotionally immature. They're, they're emotionally um, very vulnerable, and they're placed in this uh, artificially confusing environment. Mm -hmm. Nothing in the evolution of their brains has prepared them for this. Well, I'm not sure I'd go that far. Okay. All right. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Yeah. If you look at children's attempts to write before they have really learned to read and write, if you look at three-year-olds signing their name. You, know, you go to a nursery school and we, get, we try to teach children how to write their name. Mm -hmm. okay. What they are largely doing is drawing their name. Yeah. I mean, you think of bitmap graphics, that's what they're doing. Right. And gradually the transition that needs to be made is from that which you create yourself graphically to that which you could create yourself but also comes preformed namely an actual letter. To the extent we creatively use pedagogy to help children make various transitions into literacy, uh, there's a term that's been floating around for many years called emergent literacy. Mm -hmm. It says, don't wait till you set them in the first grade and say, okay, class, we're going to learn to read, this, right? you know, which is what I grew up on with his big Dick and Jane books. <laughs> but instead, you attune people to the world of print. You attune kids to the fact that those things say things. You're driving in a car and the sign says stop and you say S-T-O-P, it means stop, halt, we just did it. This is what Sesame Street in large part was designed to do and has been highly successful in. Mm -hmm. One of the things we know, for example, is that your average child entering kindergarten or first grade knows the alphabet. And it's not A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, knows L-M-N-O-P, because they have seen this program is brought to you by the letter M. We have all these teaching yeah, dictionaries. Is, you know, first of all, this is a departure from whether there's an evolutionary precedent for it, which is what we're talking about. I mean, we've been speaking, depending on who you talk to, for communicating for a million-ish years, um, uh, speaking mm. orally from a point of view of uh, anthropology. Uh, from our vocal track having changed uh, enough so we can form years distinct ago, phonemes. Right? Okay. Um, the alphabet's only 3,500 years old. Right? It's only become commonly used. 3,500 years old. The alphabet's not 3,500 years old. Well, how old is it? Well, it depends whether you want to call consonantal alphabets alphabets or not. The argument, so for example, if you look at the Semitic writing systems, right. Which is whether it's Hebrew, years. right. Okay. But there are many people, starting with Eric Havelock, right. and going in some ways with through the Greeks, Lacunin, 700 BC, roughly, who will say something dramatically different happened. Whether they write or wrong is another question. But With they will the say, by introducing the vowels and actually being able to represent everything you say, right. then in essence having a mnemonic shorthand okay. for it, so then it's, something happens. It's happened. less than 3,500 years old. That's okay. even better. But, but, okay, but what that says is, so what? You're talking about a very different situation than the Greeks cared about, than... Um, was cared about, let's say, in 17th century England, namely, how many people do you want to have literate? In Greece, the vast majority of the population were slaves. I don't Even among the children people harmed by the process of becoming okay. literate. That's okay, what but, but, but we have to ask, what are the other variables at work 
we can't just wave this magic wand and say, poof, because we believe in universal literacy, we need to do things differently. Let me make the analogy with Chinese. If you have an elite class that is learning Chinese, and anybody could learn written Chinese, except you had to not have to work in order to do it. So in essence, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy as to who would learn written Chinese. It was a small number of people. It took many, many years, but it was highly doable. If, however, as in contemporary China, really beginning with Mao, you decided you want everyone to learn to read, you have to do something to the writing system. Hence, they simplified the Chinese character system. So you have two systems of written Chinese, and there are big babbles as to which one you teach, particularly in the United States, and so forth, if you're teaching Chinese. All right. But that was done as Ataturk was able to change the writing system for Turkey by saying, you're doing it. That was done by someone in a position to do it. Yeah. With and there are also, and there also, we have to remember, few enough literate people so that you weren't kicking up an enormous fuss. In the United States, almost everyone who has at least been to school has had exposure to and some beginning kickstart on literacy. So if we're talking about some change to the whole alphabetic system, not just for pedagog pedagogical purposes, but for changing the system, we're talking about something that would benefit many people, it sure couldn't hurt, but that you have this incredible amount of inertia. For That's it. the assumption. No, let me give you an example. Do you remember when the United States decided it was going to gradually go to the, the metric, metric system? system. Sure. And still, if you come out of Boston, you're heading towards Providence, you get off Route 128, and you get onto I-95, there's a sign that says how many miles and how many kilometers Providence is. That's the only sign I still see standing. Oh, they're pretty common in the West. All right, they may still be there. That's the yeah. only one I've seen recently in the East. It did. And the speedometers all have it, right? They have it both. Most of them do. I don't know because I drive a Swedish car. Okay. But, but I don't. It didn't take sure the inertia of making a change of this kind. Plain old what was it? What was the, uh, the 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 great linguist before Chomsky? Um, Leonard Bloomfield, Edward. No, Sapir. no, in between, in between Bloomfield and uh, Hockett. Charles Hockett. Right. So okay. It's easier for people to change their religion than their writing system. That's probably true. <laughs> Which I thought framed it beautifully. That's probably true. Right? But it nonetheless is true. So if but I'm not want... Let's suppose that we're not trying to change the writing system. You're trying to teach whole, children to read. I'm, and I'm trying to say that, first of all, to adults, right, to mm -hmm. us, yes. that most of our children are in some degree of struggle with this learning to read process. The challenge and struggle are not the same. 60% of our 12th graders are reading below proficiency. And in the Boston school system, I believe the average SAT score is 270, with 200 being the floor. But that doesn't mean that nobody's learning anything. It means that there's a I real problem in the education I'm sure, system. I'm sure there's some but, struggle going but, on. But, what I, but the question to, me, to, to my mind is, how do we solve the problem, and at what level do we address the problem? Is it realistic to say, change for everyone a writing system? And I don't believe the answer is I'm sorry. <laughs> we put that aside. So if there are struggles, we then have to parcel out how much of the struggle is indeed caused by the non-one-to-one -one correspondence between sounds and graphics. Exactly. How do we push and we spotlight don't know and learn that. our way into that? And we don't know that. The only reason There is ways to determine that. But we can determine that there is a lag time between a visual intake and a mental output, whether it's reading aloud or processing some written text. Well, initially, we, as, as I understand... We, we can probably map that. Yes, right, and that there's a series of assembly steps that take time. Right, but, but there may be, and I'm not enough of a neurologist to address this, there are probably lag times in processing many things, including spoken language. Sure. And the spoken language processing lag time surely isn't the victim my, of the alphabetic system. No, 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 clearly, <laughs> clearly. The point, though, is, is that the alphabet system, this, this thing, yes. is a technology that's much newer in the horizon of than, than the, speech, than, than speech without a doubt, and then older writing systems. Nearly 100,000 years. Right. Right. 
So we have this this technology, which, as you said, nobody was minding the store on as this confusion came in. As they tend system, not to. As they tend not to. So we've got this confused, archaic technology, which we are not biologically wired up to process in the same way as speech. Well, I don't know that, that we're biologically process, wired to process any writing system. Agree. <laughs> That's the point. Even if it is a totally phonetic system. I'm not I sure agree. we're wired I agree. For. I agree. Okay. Completely. So we've got this artificial technology, yeah. right, that has got to cue our, as, we, as our eyes scan it, it's got to cue our brain into the simulated recreation of thought. Okay. Hmm? This is a technological process invented by people 3,500, 2,400. That, that evolved. evolved. <laughs> so we can't say okay. they invented it. All right. It evolved. Right. It evolved. Well, at some point it, it went from zero to, to some beginning existence, but sure. it's a human contrivance. Good. That'll, it it that'll didn't buy. fall off the trees. <laughs> that'll buy. It didn't grow out of us in that way. It's a human contrivance that that most of our children aren't doing so well with. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. And I don't have the answers. But yeah. to, to address this issue yeah. of what's going on with this 60%, I have the following questions. Okay. Number one. How many are non-native speakers of English, and when did they come to the United States? Because the, because the immigrant composition of this country has changed dramatically. I'm meeting with the, the Assistant Day. Secretary of Education in two days, and that's one, one of the Terrific. very top of my questions. One of the things that I, I do on the side is I direct a program for teaching English to speakers of other languages. Mm -hmm. And we look at this issue of how do you become bilingual. What is the best way to learn English? Is it bilingual immersion programs? Is it uh, immersion just English programs? And how much does the age at which you came to the United States matter? Another question that matters inordinately is even if you were born in the United States, because we now have second and third generation kids What's who are in language? ESL classes. Mm -hmm. How could this happen? This is the United States. Don't they hear English? Not that much. Because if you go to a school or the playground, and in your neighborhood, and at home, you're speaking your native tongue, which is not English. And reading is not a great way to learn how to pronounce a language you don't know. Indeed. Particularly in English, okay. and per especially in English. Okay, so I would want to know what percent of the population has English learning issues, which are separate. Help me find it out. I'd love to, I'm, I'm after the same <laughs> okay. information. Then I want to know what percent of the population would we call in uh, failing schools that are failing across the board. Mm -hmm. What are their levels of achievement? Pick your favorite area. And is reading corresponding to that? Now, one could say, well, reading is causing it. I'm not sure we really want to have such a simple correlation. Then I want to parcel out those children who have no exposure to print at home. Sure. Because there are many for whom print is new in any serious way when they go in to school. Right. So and they haven't had this for, emergent literacy process. I understand. And even though they haven't had this emergent literacy process, a lot of children, if not most children, they're getting exposure to letters and their names in the crib. I mean, from mobile right. on, they're seeing a letter, and it's usually discrete, separate from a bunch of other letters. This right. is a this, and this is a this, and this right. is a this. And so for years, they're getting trained to have an impulse association. Well, it's a middle and upper middle class behavior. I mean, or, or something that you work on having programs for, for lower SES groups. It's not something everybody's got. Okay. I, I mean, it, it, what we think about it, one of the things that we've learned in language acquisition is if you think you're studying a representative population and then you build your theories about how children learn language on that population, you may be missing lots of perfectly normal kids who do it very differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to be careful about assuming... Take the Sesame Street thing you were talking about before. All right. right? They are creating uh, a association between a letter and its name. Right. And it's heavily middle-class kids, not the group for whom the series was designed originally, who are using the, the Let's series put it this for that way. purpose. For those children that do get this <laughs> All right, branding, fine. okay, right? right? What they are, uh, their brains are getting this associational, almost reflex response to the sight of a letter. One with assumes a sound. If, if that's how learning takes place. I mean, that's the hope. I, I can't assume well, it happens, but presumably. That's why that, we bother that, doing that it. When that does happen, we go from these discrete le letters, yes. which have definitive sound correspondence, to putting them into groups 
where they're going to be read as a group in a, in a series rather than in isolation, and the letters don't sound like this anymore. Uh, but wait a second. If you look at some of the basal readers, which are books intentionally designed to pare down the vocabulary and the syntax. Yeah, I have. Okay, and some of them are really boring. They're ambiguous as hell if you look at them in terms of letter sound. That is probably true, but you could, without much problem, start reading where there is a good one-to-one -one correspondence, and I wouldn't worry about TH meaning th versus the, because kids can handle it. It's the vowels that are the issue. Okay. So part of the question is, how do you introduce sound symbol correspondences? Exactly. And then how do you empower How do people? we create this unfolding right. ramp that introduces and then helps resolve right. these various levels right. of nested ambiguity now, with a training wheels effect? Okay. Now, the so-called whole language approach to reading claimed that's what it aimed to do by going at the problem from both ends. Right, but it short circuits the decoding and creates a crash later because you can't work off a site. Indeed, system. because what happens is just as a lot of bilingual programs say, we work in both languages, but in actual fact, you work overwhelmingly in English and then a tad in the native language. Right. Similarly, most of the whole world word approaches aren't whole word, they're, or whole language rather, they're whole word. Right. So you get a whole bunch of exposure to all these Sound symbol correspondence is a word at a time, and the assumption is you're going to see, ah, oh, yeah. A can be pronounced the many is ways. Implicitly, the children will learn we'll these distinctions by processing them without ever having to be volitionally, consciously trained to the don't. They creep, clearly. So, California proved it. Yes. Fourth grade crash. So, method. do we go back to phonics? Yeah. But what is phonics but a 16th century adaption to the mess of the code? But if we've agreed. <laughs> that at least we have to put aside the question of could we, with our fairy god one, one, change the code, we have to ask, how do you teach people to break into that code? Right. I mean, that, to see to me, is the problem. Exactly. Okay. We so, are there together. Fine. So what one has to ask is, what are the tools available? One tool available is the whole word approach to complement, but I do mean to complement, not to substitute for, an analytic approach. Then the question is, how do you go about the analytic approach? And there have been a bunch of ways, whether it's the initial teaching alphabet or magic spelling or phonics um, or this other possibility I'm suggesting of write one version of those above the real words. Now you got a code to interpret a code. But at least what you have said, because kids know how to interpret graphics very well, they know the big one is the one that I'm going to have to get to, and the little one may be my training wheels. On a bike, there are the big wheels and the little you. ones. I am with you on the training wheels <laughs> metaphor, more than you can possibly imagine at this okay. point. Okay. Um, so what one also needs to do, and I bet you this will account for some considerable amount of your 60%, is find a way to make decoding written text matter. Yeah. Which means books at homes, which means after school programs. In order for it to matter, in order for interest, excitement, the affect to stay entrained in during the process, it, it has to be able, there has to be some kind of a ramp into it that All doesn't right. create this con continual confusion that doesn't feel good and that creates a shame aversion that doesn't want to do it. All right, so you know about the attempts of um, write first, read later. Yes. That say, yes. there's something in your head. The problem with that is, is that, again, the write first. There's an entirely different time to construct there than in reading. Reading has to assemble this thing faster than we can think about. But when you start reading, you don't read that way. I mean, one asks oneself, why does it take so long to become a so-called fluent reader? Why does it take so long to become a... even For the modern, machinery of automaticity to click in. Right. It's slow in happening. Consider people learning a second language. Well, these, they don't all read fluently. It no. takes years sometimes. But how much of that is the, is the crude technology and the fact that we're so certain that we can't touch the technology because of all the inertia and all the historical examples that it can't be changed, that we don't even want to think about it? Well, there are two issues. One is, have we thought about it intelligently? And have we said, okay, these are the... 17, or the 117 problems, let's pick them off one by one. Right. Like, are they, can they go into clusters? 
Can we learn how to handle them? What is the nature, okay. the map of ambiguities, right. the challenges right. involved in because, moving through them? I mean, it's very much the same issue one has in teaching the past tense to non-native speakers of English. Because there are all these exceptions, and if they just have all these exceptions, it seems unlearnable. Once you start clustering them, as for example, David Crystal has nicely done in this book on the Cambridge Encyclopedia of the English Language, he said, this group works as a whole, this group works, this group works, then you have a target to aim at. It's, it, it's finite, I'm you can count it. ambiguity on a ramp that's situationally right. relevant and understandable so, who's learning so, through so, it. So one needs to say, what's the totality of the ambiguity? And how do we approach them in clumps? Exactly. Japanese school children learn to read those 2,000 kanji. They don't learn them all at once, and society doesn't anticipate they will. Do you have evidence on the efficiency of the training wheels effect to the learnability of the Japanese writing? No, but it, you know, I would say contact the Japanese cultural whatever it is in Washington, and they'll have a cultural attache, they'll know somebody. I, um, I mean, my, friend, my folks who teach Japanese. It's five minutes to 11. I don't want to get you in trouble. Ten after would work. It's okay. Okay. I'm enjoying this. Well, ten after is fine, but ten after would take. We don't have, we have five minutes to take. Oh, we have five minutes to take. Oh, that's easy. Oh, that's right. So that we can talk about later. Yes. How to find some. I'd like to have more conversation after the interview if you're open to that. Sure. Good. Uh, we'll just figure out when, because I've got to leave and then. No, 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 not today. Some after, other time. We'll sure, this, this sure. trip that's just, just kind we'll, of we'll figure out not time. maniacal. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> Well, that's my name. Good. Well, I've really appreciated our time, and uh, and I got some great jewels. Uh, <laughs> and uh, anything know. else that I haven't addressed that you, you can go back really and wanted. Look at it. And I'll look at my questions. Okay. Want to talk about why we have so many phones? I mean, I wrote some stuff out. Yeah, you did. You just read it if you want. The answer is no. Right. No, I got that. <laughs> I got that. I just think it's interesting. I mean, That's fascinating. Talk about, talk about it. Because at some level, that means um, both a, a merger of these different language systems and adaptions and adoptions going on between them, but also a capacity, an increased capacity for more distinction. Right. The ability to assemble more complexity with those distinctions. Right. Now, one thing that would be useful to spend two minutes on is the question of whether a language can gain or lose phonemic distinctions, mm -hmm. and whether it needs more letters in the alphabet to capture new phonemic distinctions that didn't used to exist. The English language is a nice is a nice example here. We didn't used to make distinctions between s and z. Rather if that s or z appeared in the middle of a word between two vowels, we would pronounce it z, we'd voice it. And that very often happens, it's called intervocalic between two vowels, voicing of consonants. We do it all the time, even if we don't change the spelling. There were relatively few words in English that needed a z, as in an initial sound, or even that medial, middle of vowels, z spelled with a z, like rouge, rouge. French. We borrowed from French the grapheme. Now, it was the same Roman alphabet, but we didn't have any use for it before. And we borrowed the phonemic distinction, so you can have sounds, as Shakespeare used to say all the time, starting with the z, which is different from sounds, which you wouldn't have done in Old English because we didn't have that distinction. And then because there was a handy grapheme around, Namely, the z, we just borrowed it and repurposed it. I mean, we, we, it was the same purpose used in French. We just mm -hmm. hadn't needed it right. in English before. So languages can gain phonemic distinctions, but often you don't need to officially have something you call a separate sound because you can predict by whether it occurs in the middle of a word, if it occurs at the end of the word, whether it's going to be a t, d, s, z, and so forth. So there is that flexibility and there is that change that can take place over time. So languages can gain phonemes, and I'll bet you they can lose them as well. Yeah, I would bet I would imagine as well. Thank you so right. much. What a wonderful time. I had fun. I had fun. <laughs>